Well, well, well. Good evening, my friends. Good evening, my friends, and welcome to another Wednesday night edition of the New Hope Baptist Church virtual prayer. Uh, virtual prayer. What am I thinking about? Virtual Bible class. Uh, and we just thank God for you sharing with us tonight. It is the second day of November. November the 2nd, 2022. My, this year has gone by so fast. Before you know it, we'll be ushering in, the Lord's will, we'll be ushering in another year. And we just thank God for his grace and his mercy. I hope you had a great day. I certainly did. And we just uh, are excited to be able to come and just share with you uh, once again, for another virtual Bible study. Listen, as we say every week, we want to encourage you uh, to share these videos on your timeline. If they have been a blessing to you, they most certainly would be a blessing to someone else. And so we encourage you to uh, share this video on your timeline. We try to bring you. Uh, material and that will stimulate you to think. Uh, we don't just uh, you know try to get material that's controversial, uh, but we we we're trying with the Lord's help and the Lord's influence, the influence of the Holy Spirit. We are trying to do our part in fulfilling Ephesians chapter four verse eleven, building up the body of Christ. We want to encourage you become serious Bible students and see what the word of God is saying for yourself because there's so much out there today. So much out there today, even on Facebook, YouTube, whatever, even in our pulpits, in our own individual churches, uh, people are teaching stuff that may not necessarily line up with the word of God. And so you need to be like the Bereans. The Bible says that uh, Paul and Silas were preaching in Berea, and that the Bereans would, every day after they preached, the Bereans would go home, search the scriptures to check to see whether or not Paul and Silas were speaking according to the scriptures. And that, my friends, you need to be able to do that. You need to be able to search the word of God for yourself. Don't depend on some preacher. Don't depend on some teachers. Don't even depend on me. Learn how to study the word of God effectively and contextually and correctly for yourself. So that's that's what we're trying to promote uh, with these Bible studies. Uh, we, we're trying to promote you to get into the word of God for yourself. Well, listen. With that in mind, we have a great lesson for you tonight. We're going to talk. We're going to be talking about. Uh, I think last week we talked about the great omission of the Great Commission. This week we're going to talk about uh, a verse. The verse that comes right before that, Matthew twenty-eight and eighteen. We're going to talk about this, this concept of all power. All power. I, I keep hearing it. I was. Uh, gazing through some uh, YouTube videos the other day, gospel group was singing, you know, and they talked about how, you know, God raised Jesus, Jesus got up with all power in his hand. And, 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 you know, of course, when I'm preaching, we talk about that all power and we present it in a certain way. But, but I don't think the way we traditionally present it is what Matthew actually had in mind. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. All power or all authority, what difference does it make? But in the meantime, we want to encourage you uh, to be prayerful. Uh, pray one for another. I want you to en encourage you to be praying for all of those who stand in the need of prayer. On the last Thursday, uh, during our prayer uh, meeting, uh, we were just just came on for a second because. Dr. Miller was sick, uh, but hopefully she'll be okay tomorrow, and hopefully things will work out. 
and we'll be back on the prayer line uh, ready to go tomorrow. And so we want to encourage you uh, to just call in, call in, and don't just be praying when you call in, be praying all day, pray every day. But that number for the New Hope Baptist Church prayer line, that's every Thursday from 8 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That number is uh, 774-220-4020. Again, that's 774-220-4020. And once you call that number, uh, the access code is 372-1137, followed by the pound sign. As we pray tonight, we want to be uh, remembering uh, some families who've had uh, some loved ones to pass in our community. We are praying for the Manuel and Reed families, the Manuel and Reed families. Uh, Sister Shanika uh, Manuel, young lady, uh, passed uh, on the 27th. I believe that was last Thursday on the 27th. Her funeral is going to be uh, Saturday at uh, 1 p.m. at the Springfield Baptist Church in Newburn, Georgia. Interment is going to be at uh, Longwood Cemetery. Uh, that's Saturday at 1 o'clock at the Springfield Baptist Church in Newburn. Visitation will be Friday at the Young Levitt Funeral Home in Covington Chapel from noon until eight until eight p.m. So we want to keep want us to keep the want you to keep the manual and read families in your prayers. Sister uh, Shanika Manuel passed, um, so we we're lifting that family up in our prayers. We're also lifting up the Stodge Hill Nolly family, the Stodge Hill Nolly family, uh, Sister uh, May. Frank Stodgill, she passed uh, on the 29th, and her funeral is uh, also Saturday at 11 a.m. That's Saturday at 11 a.m. Uh, from at the Sims Chapel Baptist Church. I believe the burial will be in the church cemetery there at Sims Chapel at Sister Stodgill's funeral. Uh, that's Saturday at 11 a.m. And uh, she also, uh, her visitation also will be at the Young Levitt uh, Covington Chapel. So Young Levitt is uh, servicing and assisting both of those families, the Stodge Hill family and the Manuel family. Uh, and both visitations will be going on uh, Saturday, uh, Friday afternoon from noon until 8 p.m. Uh, you can visit and share. Uh, your uh, uh, condolences at the Young Levitt Covington Chapel. That's over on West Street, 3106 West Street here in Covington, Georgia. We're also praying for the Derringer and the Luther Rice family. Dr. Dennis Derringer, a longtime professor at Luther Rice, um, passed uh, on the 28th, and his funeral will be uh, Friday the 4th at, uh, let's see, that's 11 a.m. at First Baptist Church in Conyers. That's Dr. Dennis Deringer, longtime professor at Luther Rice College and Seminary. His funeral will be Friday at 11 a.m. at the First Baptist Church of Conyers, visitation with the family will be one hour prior to the service also at the church. So we're keeping these families in our prayers. Uh, we're also praying for the family and friends of uh, the young man who was killed uh, just the other day in Houston, Texas, the young rapper. I believe his stage name is Takeoff. He has roots. He's from the Gwinnett area, I believe. In here, in here in the Atlanta area for Gwinnett County. And so he was visiting over in Houston and met an untimely death, was shot and killed 
uh, the other night, Tuesday, uh, early Tuesday morning, I believe it was, young rapper by the name of Takeoff. And so he has family roots in, in the Atlanta area. We're praying for his mom and all his family and all of his fans and his friends as well. We thank God for our sister, uh, let's see, that's sister Beatrice Sanders. She went in for surgery. She came out okay. She's doing well, recuperating at home. Thank God for her. We're lifting up uh, Mother Florine Wilburn in our prayers. I understand she was in a, in a little fender bender the other day, but she's doing okay, uh, going through some issues, other health issues as well. But we're keeping her, her in our prayers, as well as Mother Betty Jackson. So we're keeping all these people in our prayers. There's so much going on. Uh, listen, this, this was not even the tip of the iceberg of what we need to be praying for. But uh, sometimes it seems like it's overwhelming to us. But God is still in control. And God knows all about it. He's able to handle the situation. So let's go now to the Lord in prayer. And then we're going forth with our lesson for tonight. Father God, in the name of Jesus, again, we thank you uh, for this privilege and this opportunity to just come one more time uh, to share with the people virtually a word. Uh, we pray, God, that as this word go forth, that it will be a learning experience for them uh, and that you will speak to them through your word, through this uh, lesson, uh, that we all will be um, more equipped as your disciples. Father, we pray now that you would just uh, forgive us of our sin. We pray, God, now for those families that we mentioned. Uh, the Reed and Manuel family, the Stodge Hill and Nolly families, uh, the Deringer and Luther Rice uh, family. God, we just pray that uh, for uh, Takeoff's family, uh, Father, the young rapper. Lord, there's just so much going on. So much going on. But God, you said in your word, blessed are they that mourn so they shall be comforted. And so God, we just pray now that uh, you will comfort them right now as only you can. And help us, oh God, to be instruments of your comfort, instruments of your care. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, God bless you again. And as we said earlier tonight, we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about all power or all authority. What difference does it make? All power or all, or all authority. What difference does it make? So let's see what this lesson is all about. <laughs> Excuse me. All power, all authority. What difference does it make? Of course, now we're getting this from Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, where the Bible says, and I have two versions here. I have, I have the King James, and also have the new King James. It says, and Jesus, the King James says, and Jesus came and spake to them, unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The new King James says, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Earth. I hope you caught that. Because in the King James, it says all power. The New King James and the other modern version translation, they all say all authority. So that's basically what we're going to be talking about tonight. What difference does it make? Uh, all power, all authority. What difference does it make? What is the difference? 
Well, the traditional reading, I want to suggest that with this traditional reading, and what I mean by the traditional reading, I'm talking about how it is presented in the King James. Most of us grew up reading the King James Version of the Bible. It is beautiful as far as its poetry is concerned, its style is concerned. Uh, it's, it just takes you to another place. Uh, but I, I want to encourage you, my friend, that if you are a serious Bible reader, and all of us should be serious Bible readers, don't marry a version of V E R S I V. Don't be married to a version of the Bible. Uh, I know there are some people say, well, you know, this version is inspired and that version is not inspired inspired that's 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 the only the only the only scriptures that were inspired were the original autograph okay what you have in your hand and i'm i'm holding in my hand uh this this particular bible here is the uh New American Standard Bible, okay? I believe it's a 1995 edition. Okay, it's in English, okay? Nobody in your Bible, but none of the characters or people we read about in the Bible, none of them spoke a word of English, okay? The two principal languages of the Bible, Old Testament, you're talking about Hebrew, New Testament, you're talking about Greek. So what we have, what we hold in our hands when we read our Bible, we, we, are, we are holding a version of a translation, okay? We're holding a version of a translation. Now, Anybody who studied languages will tell you that inadvertently, when you shift from one language to another, meanings can be lost and confused. Also, you have to take into consideration that the King James Bible uh, that we so love was originally translated, first published, in 1611 in English. And many of the English words that were current, that were in current uses, usage in 1611 uh, mean have different meanings today. So you need to keep that in mind too. And that is why I suggest if you are a serious Bible reader, and like I said earlier, we all should be serious Bible readers. That you read the text in more than just one version. Get you a, get you a, if you got, if you're partial, excuse me, if you're partial to the King James, that's fine. But also study the scriptures, study your passage. In the New King James, if you want to do that, uh, New American Standard Bible, New International Version, uh, New Revised Standard Version. One of my favorites is the English Standard Version. You know, read the passage in different versions, and that'll help you with your to grasp the meaning or the true meaning of the text. And so, you know, I, I, I've, I've, I've taught on this. I was looking through my record. I've taught on this at least twice uh, in the past year since we've been doing this virtual thing. Uh, I think I taught it about six months ago and almost a year ago. And, 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 and I'm teaching it again because I keep, I keep, I keep hearing uh, this 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 thing where 
we missed the meaning of we missed Matthew's meaning. And part of that is because of the way it was translated in the King James Version of the Bible. And so I want to suggest that this scripture has been traditionally and is often presently preached, presented, referred to, and otherwise when rendered inaccurately. I had the word incorrectly, but I changed it. Uh, it's not necessarily incorrect, but it's inaccurate. And I'm gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, I'm gonna, hopefully I can explain that, why I made that change, that little nuance of change later. But the problem resides in the inaccurate understanding of the KJV, King James Version. The word power in the context of the passage. One of the things that's gonna help you as you study is that you wanna make sure you are reading the passage or the scripture in context. Now, what I mean by that, don't just single out one verse. You need to read at least four or five verses before that verse, and four or five verses after that verse. You may read, need to read the whole whole section, you may need to read the whole chapter, you may need to read the whole book in order, in order to really get uh, the proper context. Now, in the King James that we stated earlier, uh, the word is power, but in the uh, other English translation, the word is authority, and I believe authority is a better translation of the Greek word that is used in the text. And the Greek word that is used in the text is a word called exosia. Exosia. And that word has the meaning of the right to do something or the right over something, the right to control or command, it means authority, absolute power or warrant. Now, let me just stop here. And I want to, I want to uh, go to um, one of my Bible versions. Bible software that will help us understand uh, what I am talking about. Let's see if I can put it up here. Okay, this is uh, from my the Logos Bible software. I've already got it to our scripture in Matthew. Chapter 28 uh, here. And uh, I'm, I have this is the King James Version. And I already have power here highlighted. And this um, is an interlineal, interlinear Bible. And I have that uh, that turned on on this uh, particular software in the Bible. But you want, you want you to notice here, and you see power here in blue, okay? And down here in my uh, interlinear text here, you got the word, surface word, power. That's how it appears in your Bible. And here's the Greek word, and here's the English transliteration of that Greek word, exosia, exosia, okay? That is the word, that is translated as power in Matthew 28, 18. All power, all exosia. And you have down here at the bottom of your page, you'll see that the sense of that word is ruling authority. Authority over a domain or sphere of influence often pertaining to the political or religious sphere. 
Okay? So exosia is the word. Exosia is the word in the Greek text. And that word uh, means authority. Talking about authority. Okay. Now, let's see, let's get back to our uh, software here, our PowerPoint presentation. Okay. So the Greek word that the King James Version translated into English as power is XOC. I wanted, I wanted to bring up that software because I want you to see that for yourself. Uh, whenever I share something with you, I'm just not just pulling stuff out of the air. I researched it, I studied it. I don't say anything that cannot be backed up or that you can't find out for yourself. Uh, if you don't have the software, that's fine. You could, you could, you could come to the same conclusion uh, by just picking, finding you a, a concordance. And, I, and, you know, at the least, this is what I encourage you, everybody to do, to invest in a, you know, if you don't want to invest in all the money in biblical software, invest in a concordance. This is this is the Strong's. This is the new Strong's exhaustive concordance. I've had this for years. Okay. Uh, I think you can get this in bookstores no more than about 19 or 20 bucks, if that much. But what it does, it takes every Greek and Hebrew word in the Bible and it categorizes them by numbers. And so you can look at the word in your text, okay? And then you look at the word for that word in your concordance. And then it has a number by it. You look at the number and it'll give you the Greek or the Hebrew uh, rendition of that word. So this is another way you could come up with the same conclusion, but this is the long way around. Uh, the software does it much faster. Now, even when we talk about the word power, there are shades of meaning. And that's why I said that, you know, I had I had incorrect at first, but that's why I changed the term incorrect to inaccurate. Because the use of the word power is not completely wrong. You just got to have it in proper context. Uh, like, you know, power is not wrong, but authority would be more accurate. Because the word authority gives us a better sense of what Matthew or what Jesus was actually saying. But like I said, the word a power, you know, could be used in that manner. But it could be a bit confusing if you don't know what kind of power you're talking about. For instance, when, when the preacher or the official uh, is marrying somebody, they will say something like at the conclusion, will they pronounce the man and wife? They'll say, by the power invested in me, by the state of so-and-so, I now pronounce you man and wife. Okay? They're saying the word power. But that word power that, they, that they're using in that context denotes authority. They're saying by the authority invested in me by the state. It refers, the word power refers to authority. And this is, what it, this is what's happening in Matthew 28 and 18. However, the problem is that traditionally, this power in Matthew 28, 18 has been, has been presented as if it was ability power or mighty power. And, and there's another word for that type of power, the word called dunamis. So what am I saying? You know, you, you got dunamis and you got an exosia. Both of them are translated in some instances as power by the King James Version. And, and, and you know, I've been guilty of this, was guilty of it for several years as a preacher, 
You know, I, I talked about how Jesus, you know, got up out of the grave with all power in his hand. You know, power to lift up a bow down here, power to forgive sin, power to power to make me walk right, power to make me talk right. You know, that's where I preached it. But that's incorrect because that's not the type of power that's referred to in that text. Like I said earlier, a better word is authority. Now let's look at the difference between power and authority. At every football game, there are not two, but rather there are three teams on the field while the game is being played. You got the offense, and they're trying to score. You got the defense, they're trying to keep the offense from scoring. And then you have another team that most people don't think about until something goes wrong and they make a call they don't like. But that other team, the officials, the referees, the line judge, the back judge, they, they are a team. Now, here's the deal. The offense and defense, they have power. They have ability. They have might. They got the power to move the ball up and down the field. They got the power to run over folks or to keep folks from scoring touchdowns. That's that kind of power. But the officiating team, the referees, they have the authority. They have, they have, they have the authority to call penalties, to penalize, to throw flags, and they influence the game. So that's the difference between power and authority. Think of it that way. That's, uh, you know, uh, I can't claim this as my own. I, uh, this illustration, I first heard this illustration given by Dr. Tony Evans, you know, and I just, I just, I just adopted it, picked it up, because it's a great illustration of the difference between power and authority. Remember, the football players have the power, but the referees have the authority. Now, the problem is, is that we have been traditionally preaching Matthew 28 and 18 as if Jesus was a football was a football player, when actually Jesus is a referee. We we've been preaching it as if Jesus was exercised, had been given uh, power, mighty power, dunamis power. But as we've seen in the text, it's a susia, it's authority, the right to rule or govern. That is the power that Jesus was given. He was given all authority in heaven and on earth. So what difference does it make? It makes a difference when it comes to exegetical integrity. It makes a difference in exegetical integrity. The noun exegesis is not found in the Greek New Testament, but it comes from the verb Exogormai, which means to lead out, which is found, you know, it's found in John 1 18, Luke 24 and 35, and four times in Acts, that's Acts 10 8, Acts 15 12 and 13, I mean 14, and Acts 21 and 19. Exegesis literally means to bring out what's in the text. You, 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 you ex, you're bringing out. What's in the text? Now, the opposite of that is eisegesis, where it's exegesis is bringing out what's in the text. Eisegesis, you're putting something in the text that's not that wasn't there. You're putting your own thoughts. You're putting your own interpretation, uh, or you you know you're making the text say, you know, according to you, instead of allowing the text to speak for itself. And and if we're not careful, we'll, we we're doing we'll be doing more eisegesis than exegesis. So to do proper exegesis, we must allow the text to contextually say, as far as we can, what the original author intended. And you heard me say this in the prior class, you know, when I was in Sunday school, one of the things they used to do, you know, we, we read a verse, and the next thing the teacher would say, well, you know, Will Harold, what does this verse mean to you? That that's the bad thing. Because it doesn't matter what the verse means to me. 
you know, that, that's not the controlling factor. It does not matter what the verse means to me. What matters is what the verse meant to the original author, what the verse meant to the original audience. And it has to mean the same thing to me that it meant to them. And as Dr. G. Roger Green used to tell us in our Greek class, you can't tell them what it means unless you know what it meant. And so if, if we don't do our homework, we can make the Bible say anything we want it to say by merely taking a verse, a passage, a scripture, even a word out of context. And we, it happens more often than we, than we can imagine. So therefore, in this particular verse, instead of using the word power, the English term authority is a more accurate representation of Matthew's intended meaning. It also makes a difference in theological correctness. As I said earlier, Jesus was not given all dunamis power. I just showed you. When we went to the uh, Lagos software, I just showed you that the Greek word behind that English word is exousia. And it was not numerous. You can translate both of them as power, but they're different shades of power. Dunamis is ability power. Dunamis is mighty power. You know, you're strong. All power to perform. And that's what, that's how most preachers and that's the way I used to traditionally preach that text. But that's not the correct. That's not correct. Why not? Because Jesus already had that power. Why? Because he was God and he is God. Je Jesus, as God, could not receive any more power in that regard than he already had. Because if he if he could receive more power, then he would be less than he would have been less than God. Okay. But Jesus was given all authority. Which means God made Jesus, according to Acts 2:36 and Philippians 2:9 through 11, the CEO of the created order. Now let's, let's read that right quick. Acts 2.36, uh, Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he says to those Jews and the people around who he was preaching to, this is after the Holy Spirit had come initially, and people saying, you know, folk drunk. Oh, you know, and then Peter says, no, he's not drunk. These men are not drunk as you suppose. This is what that was spoken about a prophet Joel, and then he makes he goes on this long discourse. This is part of that discourse. He says in Acts 2:36, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, that is that Jesus you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. Now, the term Lord here is not a sign is not a a a a, a, uh, a signature of deity. God couldn't make Jesus God. He was already God. The term Lord means ruler, master, sovereign. Okay? And most time when you see the word Lord in the New Testament, that's what it's referring to. Often today, we, we, we think of Lord, and we've talked about Lord as, as merely talking about his deity, which is, that's, that's not merely, but that's, that's a big thing. But that's what, that's what, that was not what it's talking about. When we say Jesus is the Lord, you're saying Jesus is the master. He's the ruler. He's the sovereign controller. He's king. And this is, this is the biblical Emphasis in meaning of the term Lord in the Bible. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. 
let's go back up to verse uh let's go back up to verse five he says have this is paul writing to the church of philippi he says have this attitude in yourself which also was in christ jesus who although he existed in the form of god and say god didn't make god could not make jesus god because he was already god okay so the term Lord is not referring to, to his deity. He already had deity. All right. He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And because he did this, this is my point. Verse 9. Therefore, also God what highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee, here's the point, every knee, not shall, as we always say, that's incorrect. Paul's not talking about what they what they should do in the future. He's talking about what, what they're going to do in the future. Paul is talking about what they should do at that point. What his hearers should do presently. He's talking about what we should do presently. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Okay? Of those who are in heaven, and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue what should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay. Not something now, now it's gonna happen, they shall do it. But that's not what Paul that's not what Paul said. Paul is saying, Paul was saying they should be doing it now, should be doing it now and that's part that's part that's part of why uh you know we we need we need to reevaluate how we've been preaching and teaching this this passage because it makes a difference in believers recognizing and giving jesus proper honor and obedience you see many believers today will readily acclaim jesus as savior but they fall woefully short in recognizing, honoring, and submitting to Jesus as Lord. And as I said earlier, there, there's such an ignorance and slackness in this area that many modern day believers think the term Lord is just another term for deity. They think when you call Jesus Lord, that means you call him Jesus God. No, no, not the, that's not the primary meaning of Lord. In that context. Or if you go to the other extreme, they think it's just a term of honorary title of, of respect, you know, like Mr. and Mrs. You know, Lord Jesus, Mr. Jesus. <laughs> no, no, no. Lord means he's sovereign ruler, he's the master, he's the head man in control. And that's what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 28 and 18. He says, God has given all authority in heaven and on earth. In my hand. I am the head man in charge. The buck stops with me. That's what he said. I am the CEO, the chief, the head honcho. There's no authority you can go beyond or above me because god has placed me in charge of heaven and earth that's the message in that text not that he rose from the grave you know and he's bursting forth with power that's not that's not that's not that's not what matthew's talking about so to recognize jesus lord and not just to recognize him as God, although he is God, 
but rather to acknowledge his sovereign authority. And this sovereign authority demands honor in obedience. That's why Paul said, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Not every knee shall bow, although every knee shall bow eventually. But every knee should bow in reverence and honor to Jesus as Lord. That's the message of the text. And we miss it. We miss it. It makes a difference in the proper understanding of Matthew's intent. You, you need to understand that these biblical writers, they arranged their material. They didn't just haphazardly write stuff and haphazardly arrange stuff. They arranged their material with a purpose in mind. That's why you have a certain arrangement in Luke. You got a certain arrangement in, in Mark. You got a different arrangement in Matthew because they, they're, 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 they're four gospels. They're telling the same story but each one is emphasizing a different point. And Matthew's gospel emphasized the fact that Jesus was the, the promised Messiah. He was the king. So this concept of king and kingdom runs all the way through Matthew. It is the, it is the overarching theme. Everything Matthew talks about is tied into the, to the concept or the idea of Jesus as king. Oh, excuse me. So therefore, the major theme in Matthew's gospel is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, with Jesus receiving all authority or all power to rule, this fits perfectly in line with Matthew's emphasis. But when we when we talk about all power as we preach it, we violate that thing. We violate that. See, Matthew's intention was to, was in the text was to stress the fact that Jesus was not just the Lord over the Jews, but Lord over all of God's created order. And so Matthew's theme and intent are better understood by using the term authority as opposed to power. As I said, you know, we, typically when we think of power, we don't think about the power of attorney. We don't think about the power the preacher has to marry a couple. No, when we think about power, we, we're talking about, you know, power, you know, operates out of light. You know, power our car, dunamis. That is the primary definition of power today, dunamis. But Matthew was not talking about dunamis. He was talking about exosia. He was talking about rulership. He was talking about governance. He was talking about authority, the right to rule. I have been given the right to rule, the right to rule over all of heaven, and to rule over all of earth. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said. So, I, I did a quick uh, word study, and I looked up all the time that the word authority and power are found in Matthew's gospel in the King James Version. And I discovered that in the King James, the term authority is found seven times in six verses. You'll find it in Matthew 7 29, 8 and 9, 20 and 25, and it's found twice in 21 23. You'll find it in 21. Verses 27, 24 and 27. And those six verses, you'll find 
the English term authority. In all seven cases where you find this English term authority in your King James Bible is translated from a form of the Greek word asousia in some form. In other words, all seven of those times, if you were to do what we did earlier, what we did earlier with the biblical software, with the logger software on Matthew uh, 28, 18, if you put the word, you know, you highlight the word power, if you highlight the word authority seven times, those, those, uh, those little six words I showed you, you were, uh, a Greek word, some form of the Greek word, asousia, will pop up. Okay. I also did it with the word power. Now, the term power is found nine times. Okay. Found nine times in nine verses in the King James. All right. So you get, you found authority seven times in six verses, but we find, uh, Power nine times in nine verses. Now, here's the problem though. When I did that same thing that I did with the word authority, I, I discovered that in four of those nine times, the word behind, well, in five of those nine times, the word behind power was dunamis. What we think about power. But in four of those nine times, the actual word was asousia. So, four of those nine times where you see the word power in your King James, it should really be authority. Now, they corrected this with just one verse with the New King James. Oddly enough, and I thought they, you know, I thought they would have done it in all the verses. But oddly enough, only Matthew, the verse we're talking about tonight, only Matthew 28 and 18 was changed from power to authority. The rest of those verses, they left them as power, even though the underlying Greek word really means authority. So instead of the term being found, only seven times in six verses authority, it should be, you find, really should find authority uh, 11 times in 10 verses in Matthew. Now, I just some of the nuances, you know, and that's what I'm saying. You've got to go beyond the English. You, ain't got to, you don't have to know Greek, you don't have to know Hebrew, but it's a good idea to know how to get back to them. That's why I encourage you, get you a, a concordance. You're not going to use Bible software. Get you, some, get you a concordance. Get you a good reference Bible. You know, a little, the Bibles that have the little small letters and stuff. When you can look up those words. Because oftentimes, the text may not be saying what you think it's saying. Okay. Like I said earlier, in, in, in the other five verses, and I got you there, uh, uh, where Matthew, the Greek word dunamis is used, is used in, in Matthew 6, 13, 22, 29, Christ there, 24 and 29 uh, and 30, chapter 26, 64, all those terms. All those times when you see the word power, the Greek word behind it is dunamis. It's power like we know. Okay. Uh, but but unfortunately, uh, King James, like I said earlier, King James, the New King James translated, didn't it didn't correct those those other where it should be a, uh, authority, except for Matthew 28, 18, which is the text we're talking about tonight. So the confusion, the confusion uh, of with the King James and the King James, the New King James, 
stems from the fact that you got two different Greek words. You got dunamis, you got asusia, and both words are translated as a single English word, power. But asusia and dunamis have two, two different shades of meaning. But if you only use one word, you fail to see the difference in that meaning. Okay? And this word, see, because, and, and, and you understand, see, Matthew uses two different Greek words, but we only have one English word uh, representing mostly with the King James Version. Now, like I said earlier, they do use authority, they do translate authority. In some verses, in the, the seven verses we found where it has authority, the, true enough, the Greek word behind it, asusia, authority, but there were four times out of those nine times where we found the word power, where the Greek word was not dunamis as we would expect it, but it was actually asusia. So, Four of those nine, where you see the word power in the King James in Matthew, four of those times, it should actually be authority. Now, here's the, here's the, here's the kicker here. It makes a difference in respect to the Great Commission. Here's the problem I have. When the preacher preaches this, all power in my hand. He said, you know, you got it with all power. And that's all he said. No reference, whatever, to the Great Commission. But you can't, you can't separate Matthew, well, you can't correctly separate verse 18 from the rest of, of the ending. Because verse 18 actually introduces the Great Commission. Jesus spoke the words in Matthew 20 and 18 as a pretext to the Great Commission. In other words, because he had been given all authority in heaven and on earth, he was duly authorized to issue the command to make disciples of all nations. But here's what we do. In our modern proclamation of that text, we say all power in the hand, you know, we get happy. Okay, we happen in. But, but we use the term power and we connect it back to the cross. When more properly, it should be authority and it should be connected to what comes next, which is the Great Commission. For instance, uh, remember, remember the wedding formula, formula by the authority invested in me? By the state of so and so, I now pronounce you man and wife. Jesus would say, by the authority invested in me by God, I now command you go and make disciples of all men. So that, that's the proper rendition of the text. So it's a matter of all or, or, all or obedience. You know, when you use the term power as is used. In most proclamations date, you know, people, ooh, ooh, Jesus had all power. You know, we, we are all, we're amazed. But that's not the purpose. That's not the purpose of the text. The text, the purpose of the text was so that you would understand he's got all authority. Hey, I need to obey him. It was meant to provide a basis for the demand of obedience and submission to Jesus. Which was the intention of the text. So instead of connecting this text to the resurrection, the proper connection is to his exaltation, as described when we read these verses earlier. Acts 2 36. You know, God made this, this Jesus you and you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Philippians 2 9, he's given them a name which is above all other names, so that's the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow, every tongue should confess Jesus as Lord. See, when we use the term authority properly and understand the verse in context, it connects this, what we talked about in Matthew 28 and 18 with those two other passages. 
it makes it unified. I'm sorry, I may be saying, well, you know, you overreacting. You know, ain't no big deal. Ain't no big deal. But listen, we're obligated. We're obligated to be as faithful as possible to the truth and spirit of the word. Second Timothy, you know, he says, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I'm suggesting you, if we if we talk about all power in his hand, the way we've been preaching, that's not rightly dividing. We are, we, are, we are obligated to be as faithful as possible to represent the thoughts and intents of God and the thoughts and intents of the original author. Was, was, was that Matthew's intention to present it the way we preach it? I don't think so. I mean, hopefully, hopefully, you know, I've, I've used the text. I've used background information. I, I, I literally shown you the evidence to the contrary of that. Because the thing about it now, he 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 wants us <laughs> to make disciples, not get church members. Make disciples. That was the command, and that command was based on the fact that Jesus was given all authority over heaven and earth. And because he's given all authority, he has the right to command us to make disciples. And that is a command, my friend. And I hope I, I, hope I explained this last week when we talked about the great omission of the Great Commission. And we've been we've been pretty good at evangelism, but that's not what Jesus was talking about. Evangelism is part of it, but that's not a whole story. That's just the, that's just the front door, and that's the problem. We get people in the front door of the church. We get them to church, and then we you know we don't do nothing else. We don't make disciples. It takes time, and effort, and energy, and consistency to make disciples. But wait a minute. It takes a disciple to make a disciple. And I, I think that's the problem. You know, we, we very few churches that I know of stress discipleship. When you read the, 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 the New Testament, the Gospels, the letters of Acts, uh, the letters of Paul, you know, they weren't known as Christians. They weren't known as church members. They were known as disciples. What is a disciple? A disciplined learner, a disciplined follower, one who takes on the traits and characteristics of his master. What is disciple? What is disciple making? Is making people, teaching them to be more like Jesus. And you can't do that with a uh, just going down the aisle, giving the preacher your hand, and saying the sinner's prayer. Is much more to it than that. So let's conclude. Dr. G. Roger Green, I want to say a word about words as we conclude. Dr. G. Roger Green, who was my Greek professor at Mississippi College when I was at Mississippi College in Clinton, Mississippi, he used to always tell us in the class, he said, he would say, words don't have meaning, words have usage. And what he meant by that, is that whenever, whenever you got to understand the culture that you're studying, you know, what do, what do I mean when I say it's cool? It's cool. Hey, man, it's cool. Am I saying it's, it's cold? I need to put on the jacket. Am I saying it's okay? Don't worry about it. Or am I saying, hey man, you know, I'm 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 the best thing since cornbread and, and crackers. I'm cool. Three different meanings, three different connotations. One word. How do you know what I'm talking about? You gotta know something about the context. The context in which I said it, the culture in which I said it. And, and this the same principle applies to the body. We can't 
put our present day culture, our present day thought processes back on them. Because if we do nine times out of 10, we're going to get the wrong meaning out of the text. So is it, uh, to correctly grasp the meaning of any biblical text, it's important that the modern reader understand not just the meaning of words, but also how those words were employed at the time of the text. And by the way, at the time of the English translation. Because as I said earlier in earlier, earlier uh, classes, uh, even with English words, the word may mean something different today than it meant to the King James translators in 1611. And you need to be aware of that. Therefore, it's impaired in our case that we understand as best we can the intended meaning of the biblical author. And I believe in our case, with this text, the meaning is best captured by using the word authority rather than the word power in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. Well, my friend, I hope this has been enlightening to you. I hope that I've given, shed you some light, given you some tools, given you some uh, food for thought. Uh, not only with just this verse and this particular concept, but I think it'd be a good idea for you to just, you know, make sure whatever you hear, be like the Bereans. Study the scripture for yourself. In order to study the scripture for yourself, you can't just, can't just read one English verse. <laughs> read several so you can get the meaning of the text for yourself. Well, God bless you. That's all for tonight. Listen, as I said earlier, if this video has been a blessing to you, it'll be a blessing to someone else. Share it on your timeline. And if you feel inclined to do so, go over to my YouTube page. I'm going to put this video over there in a few hours and subscribe, become a member over there and you'll get these videos. You'll find past the lessons and past sermons uh, on the in the video section of our face of our church Facebook page. All right. But you also find them on my personal YouTube page. Well that's all for tonight. God bless you until next time. May the Lord bless you real good is our prayer. <laughs>